No, I'm not taking a break. I'm going straight to Dr. Tim Anderson, one of our favorite guests. Tim is the director of Sydney's Center for Counter Hegemonic Studies. And amongst many other areas of expertise, he knows the Middle East like the back of his hand. Dr. Tim, thank you very much for joining us on the Mother of All talk shows once again. I wanted to talk to you this evening about the reports uh, that there has been a serious outbreak of coronavirus in camps in Idlib in Syria. Uh, the area has not been devastated by the coronavirus, which would have been too much to bear on top of all the other devastation, but it may be that the problem has just arrived. What can you tell us about that? It's one of those uh, part truths, George, uh, true in parts and with a lot of, um, let's say, a lot of uh, peripheral misinformation. Um, it's true that there is coronavirus throughout Syria, not just in the two-thirds of Idlib that the Al-Qaeda groups operate, backed by Mr Erdogan. It's true that it has been underestimated because the testing levels have been very low. But I wonder why the Western media simply focuses on one part of Italy occupied by Al-Qaeda and not on the whole of Syria, which is under a severe blockade, an economic siege, which is causing the suffering for the, for the whole of Syria. Now, you see, uh, some of the viewers will be surprised to hear uh, that the Al-Qaeda, ISIS, alphabet soup of fanaticism is still in control. Uh, of a substantial part of Syria because the news media has moved on uh, from Syria when the war to overthrow the government in Damascus was lost. Tell us what life is like for those people still living under ISIS and Al-Qaeda. Well, life is very difficult for those who are trapped, but the people who are in Italy, by the way, there is probably something like uh, a little under a million. I think the, the Western media is talking between two and four million, and it's nothing like that. But life throughout the north of Syria is very difficult. I was there last year, and this economic siege and the, the siege on the countries around it, including Lebanon and the near collapse of the Lebanese economy, has made life extremely difficult for everyone there. People are really struggling to get the bare necessities of life throughout Syria. Now, those living under ISIS rule, under Al-Qaeda rule, of course, have it very difficult. But let's see, all of the Western aid agencies are the ones going there and reporting back about Idlib as though this were the only part of Syria that was hard hit when it is, in fact, the Western sanctions, the economic siege measures that are the principal cause of the misery for people throughout Syria. So the Western aid agencies and media and political class are seeking to weaponize uh, coronavirus in the uh, ISIS al-Qaeda occupied parts of Idlib. These are the only areas they're really reporting on, aren't they? The, the ISIS families that are being held by the other US proxy, the SDF in the northeast of Syria, the people in Idlib, um, once again, we have the same sort of propaganda as we had with Aleppo, that somehow, for some reason or other, the Russians and the Syrians are targeting civilian hospitals there. That's all that they're attacking. In fact, the other day, the Russians destroyed a, an Al-Qaeda training camp and a fuel dump in Aleppo in, in Jarablus. But very little you will see in the English language Western media about this. Now, you mentioned uh, Erdogan, and he's never out the news now. Uh, his uh, forces were in Libya and uh, stopped uh, a military transfer of power, helped negotiate a new dispensation. We'll see how long that lasts. His forces are in Azerbaijan in their attempt to destroy the Armenian enclave in Nagorno-Karabakh. He's even sent Syrian jihadists from Syria to both Libya and Azerbaijan. He's uh, daggers drawn now with uh, President Macron in France. He's uh, daggers drawn with 
the government of Greece, a fellow NATO member and an EU member uh, over the exploration and exploitation of oil and gas fields in, uh, in uh, Cypriot and Greek waters. He's, he's gone from a policy of no quarrel with the neighbors to a quarrel, if not a war, with all the neighbors. Yes, that's a very good perspective, George. He has serious regional ambitions, none of which are really bearing much fruit, but they're a very good distraction from domestic politics. One thing I could add to that is that he has sent the mercenaries from Idlib across to other parts of North Syria um, under the pretext of fighting Kurdish militia there, which are in some parts aligned with the US, in some parts aligned with the Syrians and the Russians. But the aim is for him to um, keep, occupy and keep a very large slice of northern Syria, not just Idlib. Why does he want a slice of Syria? Well, it's, it's, uh, it, you can link it back to the Ottoman pretensions of controlling the entire region. As you pointed out, his reach has stretched from Libya to Azerbaijan and he already effectively occupies a, a large part of Idlib. That is why it's so in, intractable, the problem of the Al-Qaeda groups. He occupies a quite a wide strip, sometimes up to 20 or 30 kilometres deep into northern Syria, central north Syria, and across to... Uh, the only constraints really are the, the US occupation in, in parts of the northeast and the Russian and Syrian uh, emplacements throughout North Syria. So he is really trying to expand the footprint of his neo-Ottoman empire and at the same time uh, try and feed that into domestic politics to main maintain his position there. How does it, what does it say about NATO, uh, that a NATO member can be almost literally at war with other NATO members, with Cyprus, with Greece, uh, and uh, openly, publicly describing the President of France as in need of uh, psychiatric uh, help, organizing uh, a mass boycott uh, of everything French uh, around the Islamic world, um, stimulating uh, demonstrations which sometimes turn violent uh, in Muslim countries against France. Um, I'm not a supporter of NATO myself, uh, but it's passing strange. It's certainly not solidarity, is it? No, it's, uh, I think it's best seen as a type of inter-NATO rivalry uh, for influence. The French, remember Sarkozy, wanted a slice of Libya after they'd successfully destroyed government there and there's a now rivalry over that um, there's a rivalry in the region there, there are pretensions that mr erdogan has for lebanon as well and you will see that mr macron has gone to lebanon as some sort of conquering hero not really understanding that former colonial powers are not necessarily seen the way that they see themselves so there is a crossover and a conflict, a, a inter-imperial rivalry, if you like. Nevertheless, in both cases, let's remember that Mr. Macron and Mr. Erdogan can't really do very much if they go against the, the big power that is really controlling events in the region still, even though it has very few troops left in Syria, for example. Yeah, but, uh, you know, I almost don't want to ask you this, but I think I'm bound to. The French government is up in arms about the presence on its soil of Islamist fanatic murderers and beheaders, but has spent the last decade arming, financing and proselytizing for precisely the same kind of terrorist beheaders in Syria. Uh, does none of that ever permeate uh, public debate in France? Well, I'm not an expert on public debate in France, but we could say the same thing about the US and Britain, couldn't we? That the US, France and Britain are this triumvirate that have been very happily uh, financing extremist sectarian groups, uh, throat cutters, uh, against the targets, their own targets, independent countries in the region that they want to um, submit, they want to subjugate, um, whether it's Iraq or Syria or Libya. But they're not so happy when that uh, 
those sort of chickens come home to roost. So there has always been this sense that this sort of terrorism, welcome when it's targeted against uh, their enemies or their targets, but they don't want to borrow it when it comes home. You could say the same about the Gulf monarchies too, about the Saudis, about the UAE. They, they played that same game too. Yeah, I mean, it's almost as if they didn't read the novel Frankenstein all the way to the end. Uh, the reason it was called a monster uh, is because once you've made it, it's no longer in your control. And it might well end up back on your doorstep. Well, we saw that with, I think, the, uh, the Manchester bombing, wasn't it? That the people linked to the Libyan terrorists that had been supported by the British government there came back to attack British civilians too. I think they're aware of that. I think they're quite cynical in that respect. We know that Mr Trump, for example, had pointed out and many of the senior officials in the Obama administration admitted that they, their close allies were precisely the ones who were funding the Al-Qaeda groups and ISIS in the region. This was back in 2014. It's not that they're unaware of this. It's simply that they're selling a different story to the public and trying to manage, as you say, this Frankenstein's monster, which always has that potential uh, to come back and bite its creator. Finally, uh, what are you hoping for uh, on Tuesday, Doctor? Uh, and what difference do you think it will make uh, to the areas of the world you're most concerned with? Well, I think, George, uh, like you, I heard what you had to say before about that. I think that there's not really a huge turnaround in this system. And in many respects, I think one of the most salutary lessons will be what a failure it is, this version of democracy in North America. What sort of model are they creating for the world? They haven't been able to control the pandemic in their own country. They are failing throughout the regions in which they're interfering. And at home, when there's some problem there, they will blame Russia or blame China. I think it's a, it's a show, really, and it's a show showing us, really, the, the, the failure of American democracy. Why would anyone look for their examples, for their own countries, to that um, falling empire. I don't know if you know this number, but uh, the total amount that has been spent in this election season on the presidential race and on all the local Senate and Congress races is $11 billion. That's the total spent by the political class to choose between Tweedledum and Tweedledee, to choose between two cheeks of the same backside. Dr. Tim Anderson, Sydney Centre for Counter-Hegemonic Studies. Thank you for joining us from Thank you, uh, Australia. Now, let's take a quick break.